welcome to another episode of This Week with Sabir. Uh, in, in today's hot seat, and welcome back, everyone, from, back from our summer vacation. I was out for July and August. Now we're back today with a really strong start and a two-time guest. So this is my first two-time guest on my show. It's Stu Hynek. Uh, he's a best-selling business author, marketer, Wall Street Journal cartoonist. Uh, uh, the way he got my attention was he actually draw, drew a cartoon for me and sent it to me. And that's how we connected uh, via LinkedIn. His first book, How to Get a Meeting with Anyone, uh, we covered that in season two. So definitely look out for his other episode. I'm going to try linking it uh, in the description once once uh, we're done with this live show. Uh, and he was named one of the top 64 sales books of all time. Congratulations, uh, Stu. Uh, okay. His latest, How to Grow Your Business Like a Weed, lays out a complete model for explosive business growth based on the strategies, attributes, and tools weeds use to grow, expand, uh, dominate, and defend their turf. Uh, a twice-nominated Hall of Fame marketer and NASDAQ Entrepreneurial uh, Center author in residence, he was named the father of contact marketing by the AMA. He lives on a beautiful island in Washington State. And as always, Stu, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You reminded me of the island. I had to look out the window. Yeah, it is beautiful. It looks great today. <laughs> and, <laughs> nice and thank to you, you. Thank you again for being on the show. Well, what an honor. Thank you for having me on again. So, uh, and I did mention the book. I, I would like to flash it on the screen. Uh, so this is the book. It's How to Grow Your Business uh, Like a Weed. Uh, it's available on Amazon in three different formats, in print, in, as a Kindle book uh, and audio. So whatever, whichever version that you like, just, just download that version or, or buy that version. Definitely something that should be in your library. And definitely I would highly recommend, uh, I, I would highly recommend that. It's, it is available on Amazon. I'm sure it's available on other uh, platforms. Well, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we, we have, to, have to mention Barnes & Noble and Books A Million and others that, that you, uh, indie, indie books and so on. But, yeah, it's, a, it's available anywhere fine books are sold, really. Definitely. So yeah. Yeah, first time around, you did the contact marketing. We covered it uh, in depth in our previous episode. Uh, in this episode, now we want to talk about the new book. Uh, it sounds like an amazing book. So why did you, before, before we get into what it is about, let's go into why did you decide, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I was, I, I was driving down the Santa Monica freeway years ago when traffic used to move. <laughs> um, I mean, like we were whizzing down the freeway. That's that's like that's old stuff now. <laughs> that's old time. But anyway, we were whizzing down the freeway, and um, I noticed I noticed a dandelion growing from a crack in the concrete. And you get you got to sort of I've got to set the scene. You know, there's six lanes of traffic going this way, another six coming the other way, and then there's a 40 foot wide median that's all concrete and rushing tires, except in the media. Hopefully not, but. And so there we were, we're just blowing by the, this scene. And I noticed this dandelion just kind of blowing in the breeze, you know, and sort of, maybe it was just sort of the smoggy turbulence of the, of the traffic, I don't know, but it's kind of, you know, it had those happy yellow flowers and those seed pods and, um, you know, blowing seeds. I thought, this is, look what it's doing. First of all, how did it get there? Well, of course we know how it got there. We, we, we've seen what they do. We've, we've seen those seeds that, fly around and, and probe every possible opportunity to take root. But, you know, we see it, every, it's common. But I saw it this time and I just said, wow, that is really impressive. Look what it's doing. It, you know, it's it's just growing from a crack in, how does it even get water, <laughs> you know, from, from this crack? But there it was just running its process. And, and I just thought that was just so impressive. And I wanted to I resolved to live up to that example in my businesses because I was just, I was a young guy. I was in my twenties and, um, but just, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to start a lot of businesses in my career and I hope that I live up to that example throughout. And it got me wondering, you know, just well, how do they do this? Why, like, you know, why isn't there, um, why isn't, you know, there's no apple trees growing out, or rose bushes growing out of cracks in the concrete of median medians in the middle of the freeway. Or petunias, or or daisies, or whatever, because they couldn't make it as a weed. They're not. They don't have what it takes. So, what is it that the weeds have? What are they doing? Do they have a model? Is there? Is there I mean, it would be even more interesting if they had a unified model. So, if, if there's a model that they're all using, and guess what? They do. There is one. Um, but so, is there a unified model? And if so, 
you know, is it, is it something that we could apply to our businesses? And it, it, it is, and it's, it's just amazing. So I've just been, I've been sort of rooming, ruminating on that for quite a long time and finally decided I've got to do it. It's got to, I've, got to, I've got to research this much further, much deeper, and I've got to put it out as a book. You know, you know what's uh, the thing is I'm a homeowner and uh, I garden also, right? And one of the toughest things for you to deal as a homeowner in your driveway and uh, and in your garden, especially I love like vegetable garden. Uh, I have a vegetable garden. I have rose garden. In the middle of it, all of a sudden, doesn't matter, by the way. It doesn't matter if you put the, the brown chips in there, if you put like a tarp-like thing to cover it, it just sticks out. <laughs> it comes, yeah, starts coming out next to the tomato plant, you know. Yeah. And, and you can't you can't uh, do do much with it, uh, you know. You you kill all of all of it in your driveway. You spray it or whatever you want to do, or you remove it, and then you think that oh god, you know, you you spent just the whole Sunday doing that. Uh, you give it a couple of couple of weeks, it's gonna sprout back up. <laughs> That's right. That's, that that is instructive of so many things <laughs> in the, in the weeds model, and also just as entrepreneurs, you know. I, I think you know. Gardeners um, will tell you that a weed, some gardeners will tell you that a weed is just a plant out of place. That's, that's oversimplifying. But I would say, you know, some of the things that I think divide, define weeds are that they, they deal with what is. You just mentioned that you're out there cutting down the weeds and the, they dealt with your, with your disruption and they came right back, right? So they deal with what is, then they're not, they're not, they're not frustrated about it or or, 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 you know, depressed about it. They just, they just go to work again. So they deal with what is. They never do anything without an unfair advantage. They never do anything alone. And they always focus on what makes them win. And I would say that's a pretty good, that's a, that's a good, a good um, description of a weed, but it's also a great description of, a, of an entrepreneur. So there is a great direct um, parallel between entrepreneurs and, and weeds. It's really pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is probably the weed, weed is looking up at me going like, you, you thought you got rid of me, petty human? I'm going to, I'm coming back. <laughs> no, they don't waste time on that. They know there's a disruption. They go to work. They're just focused on, on what makes them win. And they, so, they do it. I mean, if you, if you look at that, uh, now let's draw the formula for, for growing like a weed that you cover in the book, right? Sure, let's talk sure. about what, what does that process look like and why is it different than any other rapid growth strategy and and so on yeah I'll, I'll, yeah well okay so there there are four um four elements to it one they leverage a fierce mindset that's that's element number one and unfair advantages element number two against collective scale that's number three and then they do it according to a process that well in their case is honed over millions of years but it's a well honed well honed process um that is able to adapt to any challenge almost immediately. That's that's their their formula. Now you ask like what, what's why is that different from other other strategies? And I guess we could compare it against maybe a couple. I mean, the blue ocean strategy is essentially don't go into the red water because that's where the blood is. That's where all the carnage is. That's where all the co competition is. Go go look for blue stretches of water because that's where there's not a lot of competition. Okay, fine. Um, let me think. There's um, um, the flywheel. Um, Jim Collins' flywheel, and very popular. That, that makes sense. We, you know, a business must have momentum to to continue. If you have no momentum, and what you have no reason to, you're not going to last. Um, and um, I, there's another one, um, traction. The, you know, I, I guess in a way, well, you've got to have traction in what you do, and you've got to be effective in what you do. But I would say. I don't. I don't mean to take away any of any anything from any of those. Um, the, the weed. Uh, the weed model is just different because, and I think it's. I really think that weed strategy is the theory of everything about growing anything. So, um, and I've already seen it because we're we're. I'm starting to apply it to other businesses and and um, in consulting, and we're seeing that we can use it to grow a business, or we can use it to grow a piece of a business. Let, let's say a recruiting effort. Um, mm -hmm. You could use it to grow a movement. I don't know. You could, you could use it to grow just about anything. Um, so, and you know, the thing, thing that really frustrates me a, a lot is when I'm reading through some of the business, but I, mean, I, read, I read news on, on my 
my phone and I, I'll see business publications popping up. I think it's really just clickbait, but it's just, they'll click, they'll, they'll put up a, a headline that says the one thing that you need to know, or the one thing that, that Warren <laughs> Buffett does that, that changes everything, will change your world. And you know, they'll either list one or a few things, but they're just kind of random things. This is what you need to grow. And that's not giving anybody a model. So the weeds model gives us complete, um, just, just a complete framework for, um, for, for what, it, what it takes to grow. And those four elements that I told you just a moment ago um, are, are four, le- yeah, I don't want to call them levels. They're, they're elements. Each element is a multiplier to our growth. So we don't want to leave any of those elements out. You, you've got to, You've got to be paying attention to mindset. You've got to be paying attention to creating or cultivating unfair advantages and to um, to scaling, to to um, to leverage and scale, and then also to uh, to process. Really interesting because you know I when I wrote the book and then read it, reread it because I had to you know editing it. I'm just saying, oh my God, I'm making so many mistakes in my in my own business. I, I run a small agency and mm-hmm. I'm making so many mistakes and. And the weeds model has helped me correct those. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You brought up that point about that one thing that they send you. I usually get so much spam in my LinkedIn. I get uh, through DM. Uh, it starts with that first connection request, or sometimes they don't even send me that. They do a follow-up. I, I think a lot of it is automated. Uh, but Or I, I'll get, get hit up on my own website through a submission form or something like that, or or email, somebody finds my email. And it's always to them one thing that I am missing from my yeah. from my hyper growth, right? Yeah. It's search engine optimization. That's what you're missing. You're, yeah. That's the biggest mistake I've found on, on in your business, right? Uh, somebody comes out, oh, email marketing. Somebody else says, oh, you know what? You need to be on TV. You need to, I can help you get booked on on. NPR events and stuff like that. That's yeah, their yeah. one thing, right? All the of it's is, pretty myopic though, isn't it? Because it because none of it fits into a model. Well, it does actually if they knew, they understood actually if they understood weed strategy, they know exactly how it fits into into what you need to grow your business. And they wouldn't just say all you need is C, is SEO or or any of these things. They they'd say, look, this is a way that we can help you create a, an unfair advantage in your business. That's a big deal. <laughs> you know. And and you need unfair advantages because that's part of that's one of four elements you need. And I don't know that they would go into the, I wouldn't go into all of the the, the whole model. But if you know the weeds model, um, you know where all of this stuff fits and how how important it is or how how unimportant it is. Mostly though, you'll discover that there are things that you thought were unimportant that are critical. So I uh, things like like collaborating with others. You know, weeds are natural collaborators. If you see a a dandelion in your lawn. And you think that's the only one there? Look up, because they never show up alone. There, it's you know, look up and you'll see there are dozens, at least, if not hundreds, of other dandelions. And if it was just one dandelion, it wouldn't be a factor. You pull it out, you're done. But but the way that weeds do it, they show up in great masses and great numbers, and they work together. And mm-hmm. that is, in fact, what we need to do. You know, what what you, you reminded me. You reminded me of something that Warren Buffett had said uh, once. He, when he's talking about a business, he goes like, "There's never one cockroach in the kitchen. Never." Yeah, that's you right. Know, the same. The same applies for same weed. Thing. There's. It's never the case that you'll find one weed. You pull it out and you go like, oh, "Okay, you well, know what?" That's- I, you know, I'm saying it's the same thing, but actually, I don't know if the cockroaches are. I think they're kind of out, out for themselves. <laughs> Weeds aren't that way. They are. They're collaborators, and it's. Oh, wow, it's, okay. it's really impressive to watch what they do. Now, you mentioned earlier, you said that I can apply the, the, the weed strategy could be applied to so many different types of businesses. Where do you think, you know, actually, let's talk about two sides of it, right? Uh, what businesses are an excellent candidate for weed strategy? Excellent, not good even, excellent, right? Versus uh, companies that are excellent candidate not to be, not to utilize weed strategy. Mm, good, good. Oh, that's really cool question. I think I'm going to give you a really surprising answer. I, mean, I, I love startups. They're, they're a lot of fun. There's a lot of promise. I, I love working with them. I think it's great. Um, I, I, the best one might be franchises. It's really weird, but 
I think that I used to think of, I'm sorry to all the franchisees out there, but I used to think of franchisees as, as entrepreneurs. They weren't coming up with their own concepts. You know, it's kind of like going up on the karaoke stage with a group and, and saying, well, I just sang karaoke instead of going up by yourself. Um, I had kind of all those, those attitudes toward, toward franchises and franchisees, but, but the weeds, the weed, just writing this book absolutely changed everything. I'm realizing, well, wait a minute. They're all, they're all showing, they're kind of like the dandelions I just described in the front lawn. They're all showing up together. They're all, they all have the same mission. They're all working and, and evolving the same process. By the way, they have a process. A lot of, a lot of smaller businesses don't even have a recorded process, but they have a really well, um, not only well recorded, but well honed process. And then they have, you know, a whole collection of, of, of franchisees of other entrepreneurs who are, they're all working the same challenges. And so their process evolves quicker than perhaps the, the processes of other, other businesses. So they might be the most weed-like actually. Oh, That's interesting. Really, isn't that interesting? You know, because to me, as 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 individual business owners, because a, a lot of franchises, there are business. Uh, you know, some of them own multiple fr uh, franchise units, but most of them own one, right? As an individual, you you think that their hands are kind of tied because of the operating system uh, of a um, a franchise, so that you are bound by it. So that if if the guy who is who owns the license and everything else, the operating system and guide actually has more control over it, I would think that it, it would be anti-weed, not weed-like. But the thing is, and now I get it from a collaborative standpoint, you're absolutely right. Like as a collaboration, like, you know, uh, there is a, um, there is a, um, uh, I'm sure that you've seen it on the Food Channel. Um, uh, it was a small shop, a cart called Halal Guys in the city, right? Every other, you know, uh, Halal Guys, um, uh, you know, Halal Food, type carts, you would just find them empty. You would go up your order. Whenever you saw Halal Guy's cart, and he started with one cart, you would see people lined up across the block, right? And then when he uh, when he got investors, I think he got investors involved, and, and now it's a franchise. Now you find Halal Guy's uh, restaurants, not just carts, uh, all over New York. I'm sure that it's, it's franchised in other yeah. places and just grew, like blew up very quickly. Well, and look what's happening then. If, if you're a franchisee in that group, and it's the, then what you're using is a, a model that's already been honed. And and then they, they all, they're all though, they're all still honing it. It's it's being honed in real time as well. But now with, I don't know, maybe 15,000 franchisees. So 15,000 entrepreneurs are working on honing the same thing. That's actually very, very weed-like. So wow. they, it gives them great leverage. Actually, it's it's actually I'm just like amazed at franchises now. So so okay. So that was the one that that's the one that might surprise the most. Um, the one that I think the ones that are going to have the toughest time are solopreneurs, and here's why. Um, you know, you know, you uh, did, did you play um, musical chairs when I don't know like oh yeah. Dark? So you know, we're, we're, that's like our first. Our first introduction to competition and so you know you're running around blah, blah, blah. The, the music is playing isn't this so much fun also the music stops and where where'd my chair go i don't have a chair right so so it, it causes us to say okay all right next time i'm going to find a chair darn it i'm not going to be left without a chair and, and from this point on and and i think it starts then that we're, we're you know so then you go to school and you study hard then you you get good grades and you get into a good college then you Get good grades, and then maybe maybe you go on to graduate school, or maybe not. But you go on, and you, I mean, the whole point is you go get a great job and a great career. But you can't scale that. You can't you can't have a thousand jobs. So we're so we're trained to operate on on one to one leverage. You know, and, and I would say that entrepreneurs and and solopreneurs maybe the most of all. I don't know, but the, just entrepreneurs in general tend to be the most um, self-sufficient people on the planet. I mean, they, they'll, they'll make anything happen. To their detriment. Uh, well, that's right. It's a double-edged sword because the, the problem, and the problem that I think solopreneurs are, are suffering from is they're doing everything themselves. So they're stuck in one-to-one -one leverage. And the weeds tell us, look, if you want to, if you want to scale, you need to, get, you need to root out all forms of one-to-one -one leverage. So for example, if you are part, I'm part of my deliverable. I mean, I'm stuck right in the middle of 
deliverable stream. So that was one of the things I realized as I was reading the book saying, oh my God, I've been making huge mistakes my whole career. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so one of them was, you know, because in my, in my business, I, it's an agency business, I help, I help sales teams, I create campaigns to help sales teams break through to their top accounts. Well, I want to give them something that sort of like nobody's ever seen before. I'm always looking for what's the bleeding edge of this stuff. And it usually means that I've got to work with, I, I, I'm sort of prototyping things. That, so a campaign based on putting out prototypes is a very labor intensive thing. I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm, I own the business and I guess I could call myself the CEO or something like president, but really I'm the creative director. And so I'm, I'm deeply involved in writing copy and the, that's not the way to grow anything. I'm working against my scaling. So um, you will all small, uh, I should say all solo entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, I should say, will find that they look at, they take a hard look. They are holding themselves back. They're, they're just pinning themselves to one-to-one -one leverage. So the weeds tell us, knock that off, get it, root out all forms of one-to-one -one leverage and move on to multi-channel leverage and then eventually um, collective scale. So it has to, I need to productize. That was sort of the, the realization. I need to productize what I do. And then I need to partner with, with large, um, um, you know, just large platforms to put my products, what, what, what formerly were just creative campaigns and put them out as products on large, um, on, on, on large platforms. And that will change my scale. So there are a bunch of things that I'm doing because of, of just my exposure to the, to the same, the same, same stuff you'll read in the book. That no, I, I think my business. if you may, you know, there is a, um, uh, I'll use this analogy. Can you walk from New York to LA, Los Angeles? The answer is yeah. yes. That's yeah. what most solopreneurs do. Yes, it they is. Don't, in their world, in their heads, there is, there is no rail. There is no plane. Yeah. There is no Uber. It's there is like, no car. Like there is no motorcycle. It's like climbing the wall instead of using stairs. So <laughs> you've got to you've got to you've got to branch out a bit. So yeah. I would say that solopreneurs probably will have the hardest time, but they should use it because solopreneurs, all of us. Here's the thing, and I I think one of I, I don't want to just single one piece out of the of the model because that does it a disservice, but. One of the ones that I'm really most fascinated with is um, is just the aspect of creating, cultivating unfair advantages. And really, any business that doesn't have unfair advantages won't be in business for long. <laughs> you need them. So, can you um, give so, an example uh, of an unfair uh, advantage? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a few then. So I, I'm going to tell you mine first. So I'm a cartoonist. I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists. That's a that's a huge unfair advantage uh, because. You know, when my cartoons, I mean, I've not been terribly active lately, but when my cartoons appear in the journal, um, you know, they, they appear in front of 2.1 million readers. So that's a lot of exposure that other people don't get to have. It's in the Wall Street Journal, for God's sake. That's yeah. incredible. It's very impressive stuff. When I call, when, I, when I'm sending one of our big board, you remember the big boards from the earlier um, interview, but when I send one of our big board contact pieces, so it's a big cartoon piece, I, mean, I can hold one up if you want, but it's a big cartoon piece with, with a cartoon about the recipient. And then on the other side, there's a message um, explaining who, who the sender is, why they want to meet next steps. So if I'm sending one of those things and I call up, let's say the CEO of some, a CEO of a company that I want to reach and I reach their assistant and I'm saying, hi, my name is Stu Heineck. I'm, I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists. And I'm sending a print of one of my cartoons. It's about your boss. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to it's hard to kind of match that, right? I mean, and and the, you know that the the executive assistants are saying what really? So that's a great effect. That's a great unfair advantage. Um, I've got a bunch of them like this. Having these two books out and and reaching a worldwide audience is a huge unfair advantage. Uh, on the last show, you pulled out the sword, if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dan Walton's sword campaign, brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, and and, and I, in know, that call. Also, well, here's the thing also. I've known that um, when I was creating direct mail and I was using personalized cartoons and I was breaking all kinds of response records, I knew then that I was, um, I was helping my clients. 
I was give, what I was doing was giving them a new unfair advantage. If I gave them a winning campaign, one that was that beat their controls, I was giving them a new unfair advantage. And I thought that's great. That's really cool. And I, that's a great line to use. I didn't know how it fit into, I didn't have a model in mind yet, but it fits perfectly directly into the, into the weeds model. So I, I would say one of the biggest unfair advantages, and they could be locations, they could be, um, I, they could be a, a lot of, a big one or, or, or special alliances. I've got some great, I mean, I have a, an amazing alliance coming up with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center that would be hard to beat by anyone else. So um, those are all unfair advantages. But I think the biggest unfair advantage that we can cultivate, not the only one, but the biggest one is to create the ability to bring an unfair advantage or confer an unfair advantage to, to our clients. If we do that, man, we, you got, you'll have all kinds of clients and your clients will love you. They'll love what you're doing because you're helping them. Well, you gave them a new unfair advantage. That's a huge thing. It's, it's strategically, it's, you can see where it fits into a growth model and it's a big deal. I mean, in, in, the, in the world where in the sea of sameness, right? where consumers can Google anything or get on Amazon and find whatever they're looking for and they'll find a million listings, you know? What makes you different? What make, gives you that edge is, uh, is a huge thing, right? Yeah. I mean, there are ways to controlling it through patents and licenses and stuff like that. But, but generally speaking, there are things that you could do that goes even beyond the patent, right? For yeah, example, I, just before, yeah. you know, just yeah. before, before we got onto the show, uh, you were sitting in, in front of a MacBook where you're recording this, right? Apple is an example of a unfair advantage where they could put a price that's twice the price or more than that of an IBM P or of a PC with Windows running on it, right? Twice. The same machine, yeah. same spec. If you buy the Windows version of it, you, you'll get it for a thousand bucks. But if you want the Mac version, it's three thousand, twenty five hundred dollars And people yeah, are willing yeah, to pay it. And and look what Apple did. They've, it's a it's a premium um, it's a premium experience. It's they've simplified it. I mean, I know that that um, Windows ended up sort of uh, Windows is kind of a a copy of what the the Mac OS was or is. But I mean, you know, it, um, because they made it very very simple to use the computer and and get the computer out of the way of just doing the work that you wanted to do. And then they enabled you to do all kinds of really creative, crazy stuff on the computer. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's that. And then there's also their industrial design. You know, there's a, there, you can see there's a big, big emphasis on industrial design, really sleek, beautiful industrial designs and interface designs. They, they drop products from the future into our labs. And, and so, I mean, they're just the sleekest darn things, you know, it, they're, they're amazing. And so all of those, those are all, actually, those are, that latter part, the designs, those unusual, really sleek designs are, are a seed strategy. If seeds are, in the, in the weeds model, seeds, there are eight levels of strategy for creating unfair advantages. And seed level is the, is the first level. And, and not, not that it's the most important, but it's the first one that appears from the top down. And seeds are analogous to anything that causes people to become aware of us and form the intent to transact with us. So... You could say, I mean, you look at Elon Musk. Elon Musk is in the news all the time. Elon Musk has a story, that, a life story that's just unbelievable. That story is an incredible seed strategy. And it causes us to, I mean, like, we, we want to be part of his story. And I think that's why a lot of people bought Tesla, because that's a way to become part of the story. So all of these things, you know, I mentioned, I, I covered, I should say, I interviewed Kathy Ireland, um, who was, I think she started as an SI swimsuit model, or, or mm -hmm. maybe she was modeling before that. That's when I came to know of her. Um, so she had this incredible fame. That's a great unfair advantage. Who's just gonna, that's very tough. I was gonna say, who's gonna compete with that? There are a few other, let's say actresses and so forth who, who are doing the same thing. They're competing, but really, you know, ultimately it's a pretty unfair advantage. You can't mm -hmm. beat it. No, before when you were talking about Apple, uh, and knowing you, Stu, for a while now, right, um, I thought there was a gigantic butt coming for Apple. Oh. Apple is not a coming? weed company. <laughs> well, what I'll say is that there, there are other companies that 
you know, I, I, I want to make, make the point that this is a holistic system, a holistic model, and you should be using, or if you want to, if you really want to maximize your growth, you should use all, all parts of it, all four elements, because they're all multipliers to your success, or to your success, to your, to your growth. And, and I think that Apple, um, you know, app, app, the one thing that Apple has done that maybe, I don't know whether it hurt them or not, I couldn't say, but, but it certainly, it, it, um, it characterizes them that they've been, a, they've been this walled garden. And so, um, whereas, whereas the PC uh, OS is, is totally different, it's open, open source. And, and so there's a huge ecosystem of, of, um, of, of developers, developers developing for it. Well, I will say actually, no, you know what? Apple did kind of come around. Look at what the app store looks like. I, I, is there a, are there a billion apps now? Yeah. So they have done it. Now that I'm thinking yeah. about it, that's a huge, huge element of collaboration on their part. So okay. yeah, maybe they have kind of, maybe they did come around to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want, I didn't mean to interrupt you with the thought with the Elon Musk and, and uh, SpaceX, you know, where, where, where we are trying to be part of that story and, and especially with the goal that humans need to leave Earth and go to Mars, you know, next door. Yeah. We, we need to yeah. bring the civilization there. We do need people like that in our lives to set audacious goals, you know, big audacious goals so that we can, you know, achieve them. Are we going to get to, are we going to get to Mars during his lifetime or my lifetime or yours? Most likely not. But can we colonize moon? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I think we will get to Mars. I, I do. And, and Elon will probably do it. And, uh, you know, so Elon is not just, he's not just a businessman. He's, he's kind of a, a, he's a movement. You, know? yeah. you watch and you go, well, look what he just pulled off now. You know, you know when you watch, let's say that, I mean, well, so he had, SpaceX is really interesting because they, you know, they were, they were, they almost went broke actually. <laughs> Do, trying to do this, but they're so resilient, so persistent um, or perseverant. It's, it's, they're incredible. They're an incredible example of weed like, I don't know, just weed like spread and, 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 and weed mindset because every time they fail, they learn. They, they're, not, they're not upset because they failed. It's part of the process and they have a process. And, and, and so they do, when they were building the, the, Falcon, um, the Falcon booster system, we yeah. probably, most of us probably don't remember anymore that they blew up a lot of them, you know, just like Starship has been doing, but they blew up a lot of them. And then, but they kept trying to land, do that propulsive landing and, um, you know, and they, they kept missing it, kept, they try it on the, on the barges and keep falling over and blowing up and all that. Finally, they started sticking those landings and then it became routine. And now we don't even pay attention to it, but Elon has, change the space in it or the yeah know, before yeah. that you would send it out and nothing would come back i mean they That's had right. to like dump, dump it into the ocean in the ocean yeah yeah and yeah. now he i think he's i don't know what the what the record is now it's either eight nine or eleven uses of the same booster so it's gone up eight eight times or eleven times come back down and landed like you know all in one piece yeah. it's amazing um yeah this weekend out, actually uh, the the falcon 9 i think took took up 50 Starlink satellites just this weekend, this past weekend. Yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah, he's, he just continued. He's a pretty weed-like guy, I would yeah. say. So um, the, other, the other company I want to bring up, um, and it's kind of, um, I've been working with them for, for the longest time, and not, as a, not as an employee, as an independent, completely independent for the past 20 plus years. And I recently wrote an article in Harvard Business Review it just came out in the September October issue, uh, nice. called "Should Your Should Your um, uh, Company Sell on Amazon?" It's a well balanced article that talks about how how you can score your brand or product to see if it belongs on Amazon or it does not. You know, um, so what are your thoughts on Jeff Bezos and what he has been able to accomplish with uh, with Amazon, and does it fit into uh, seed or weed? Well. Um... Jeff Bezos is probably one of the most weed-like entrepreneurs uh, ever, you know, on on the planet. So, um, you know, the, the, so the thing is, I, I mentioned the four areas: the, the, the mindset, and and they're they're aggressive, and they're every bit um, what the weed mind that they what the mindset. I'm sorry, I should say what the weed mindset is, which is 
which is optimism and, and aggression and urgency and persistence and um, adaptability and resilience, but also collaboration. And they, they exemplify all of that. Um, so you, you see it in the way that they've, they've developed a lot of IP. I mean, the, the one-click checkout is theirs, it's patented. They developed it, they patented it. Um, there's some, um, I think they didn't, they, I believe they invented or started, I think they were the first affiliate program. I'm pretty sure they were. Amazon Associates so, program, yep, very first yeah, one. I think it was the first affiliate program ever. So they did that. They're, they're incredible um, innovators. And so, but by doing that, the concept of marketplace. All these websites now just you know, selling into Amazon is brilliant. And the, the um, concept of marketplace was one, one of the earliest ones. That's the, yeah, that's the next one. Then it's all these all these small businesses could suddenly create a, a presence on, on Amazon. That sort of brought in the I it didn't bring in the whole of, of the retail ecosphere, but it brought in a lot of it. I mean, all of it that's that's just this big grove of weeds. Very, very weed-like spread. So, um, so kudos to them. I, 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 I can't even imagine. An, it's hard to imagine another business that is so fully weed-like than than Amazon. Um, I don't know. And so, you asked me the difference. Like, are they more weed or seed? Here's the deal. Um, I mentioned weed strategy is it's the theory of everything about growing anything. There are four elements. There's the weed mindset. That's not guys sitting around smoking dudes. <laughs> oh well, man. It's you know a grill, it's, it's aggressiveness and resilience and so on that I just mentioned. So it's it's the weak mindset. It's unfair advantages. It's um, it, it's uh, um, scale. You know, I should say collective scale and it's and it's process. So actually, um, let me let me let me dig into that, Stu. You mentioned weed mindset is a is a process. You said it several times. What do you mean by that? Well, no, I, I'm saying that. I, there are two different things. Mindset is one one part of it, and process is another. Um, uh, weeds have weeds have. Um, well, I'll go. I'll I'll jump to to process. Um, weeds have a, a process that if you, if you check the fossil record, flowered plants or flowering plants showed up on on Earth about 145 million years ago, and I we've got to assume that some of those plants were weed to start, because you know. They're the survivors. And so they've had, they've had a really long time to be able to hone their processes, right? In other words, to evolve. That's really what they're doing. And, and, but here's the interesting thing about their process. They're able to, although their processes are millions of years old and they're programmed directly into their DNA, so no one has to be trained or they don't have to watch videos, they don't have to do any of the things we do to get plugged in. They just run, they run their process like a computer runs a program. So, um, but, but there's a really interesting thing that happens with that process. Uh, they're able to adapt to essentially anything that comes, anything that challenges them. So I want to give you an example real quick. There's a weed called water hemp, and it's been blowing around, spreading around uh, the, the agricultural fields across North America. Water hemp is a, it's an annual, so the entire population lives and dies within one year, one season, right? one growth season, and all of their offspring, everything, their, their continuity is tied up in their seeds. Their seeds are really important to them. So while, let's say, with the one that we're most, the, the weed we're most um, familiar with is dandelions, and they produce, let's say, over a five to 10 year lifespan, they produce about 15,000 seeds. Water hemp lives one year, and each plant puts out up to 4.8 million seeds. Wow. That thing is, that sucker's never going away. Now, here's the other interesting thing about the seeds. Because it's producing so many seeds, well, there are a lot of, it produces a lot of useful mutations in those seeds. It's just by chance. I, can't, I, I don't know if it's by chance, but certainly it, they do produce those. Adaptability. Yeah. So what's happening, that's sort of the, 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 the equivalent to our R&D, to research yeah. and development. Because here's what happened with, with, with uh, water hip. It started showing up in farmer's fields. They started using, they, they used herbicides like they always did. They used herbicides to control the weeds that would, would otherwise outcompete the crops. Well, water hemp developed immunity to the active ingredient in Roundup, and 70% of all the other herbicides that farmers use within four years. Wow. Isn't that stunning? 
and you know how I, I, I think you, you we, we talked about you work in your garden so you know how deadly roundup is I think it's mm -hmm. I think the active ingredient is called glyphosate and and that stuff's just deadly and it's not it it's immune to it um that's that's pretty amazing so I mean you, you uh, kind of so reminded that, me that's how weeds use process and that's how we should, I mean we, if, you know if you if you go to if you're building your business and you want to sell it, if that's part of your plan, if there's an exit strategy and you have no process, you have nothing to sell. You don't have a business. So mm -hmm. process is critical. Process is one of those things that again, remember I was saying about I you know I've had that attitude toward franchisees and franchises that, oh, you know, they're they're kind of entrepreneurs and so on. Well, that, well, my other horrible attitude was was toward process, because I always used to think of process as this it's a negative thing. You know the rule book. You got to do everything by the by the book, and I wanted to write the book. You know, so you um, don't want to listen to the man. <laughs> I, well, I want to. I just, I don't know. I wanted to learn it on my own. I wanted to figure it out, and um, and and reading a manual would have. It was just an anathema to me. I just wouldn't want to do it. But now I realize, no, you know, process is a really super valuable thing. It's it's the it's the way that we accumulate expertise and, and experience, and then map it across the, or, the organization. That's what process is. It's our, well, if it, for one, I mean, for weeds, it's their, it's their mechanism for evolution. Um, and I guess that is true for, for businesses as well, but it's also the way that we, we, um, we seal in the value of our business. We talked about franchises a moment ago, and then a little bit earlier. One of the things that, distinct, that dis distinguishes franchises is that they start out with a very well-defined process. And it means that any franchisee can sell their, their franchise anytime they want. And it's a defined, it's a defined um, um, entity. And it's, it, anyone can step in and say, okay, I, I see. I just need to follow this process and I'll be successful with it as well. So process is really super critical. Um, and it's different from mindset, obviously. Yeah, in, in the absence of that process, you you have to figure out everything, everything from accounting yeah. to hiring the right people, suppliers, distributors, getting the customers, marketing message, name it. You can write a whole book just on that. Like if you don't want to be a franchisee, yeah. you have to figure all of that stuff out. And that's what you're getting in that, in, that's, in that that's process. Exactly you know? right. yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So now, you know, you, oh, I wanted to just, I wanted to finish another thought real quickly. You, you mentioned you said about Amazon weed or seed or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so I should I should clear this up within the, that, that section of, of creating unfair advantages. There's a there's a weeds model. So it's an acronym weed inspired enterprise expansion and domination strategies. But it's just eight levels of strategy for creating unfair advantages. That's what it, it comes under that heading up unfair advantages. So there's seed and seed pod and thorn and, and segmentation and root and so forth. There are eight levels of strategy for developing unfair advantages. So that's where that's why I was talking about seed strategy. Mm, got it. So, I mean, we, we mentioned Apple and we cannot forget because you mentioned Apple, that's Steve Jobs. We have to speak of the other guy too. And that's that's Bill Gates and Microsoft. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think? I'm going to throw some names well, at you now, you know, to, to see, to so, kind of get a good picture of, uh, you know, weed or not weed, you know? Yeah. I, you know, um, so Microsoft, well, here's Microsoft got its start by um, Bill Gates borrowing, I think he borrowed the money, paid somebody $40,000 to buy MS DOS. Yep. To sell, it to, Am to sell it to IBM. Yeah. Then he turned around and sold it to IBM. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, no, know, no, they I, didn't sell it. He licensed it to I, IBM. Well, that's right. He licensed yeah. it. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So I would say that Bill's genius, at least in the beginning, was making a deal that was like you know a deal of a lifetime, <laughs> because he recognized the value of MS DOS. He also realized I know how to get it. I know how to license it. How to get it into to IBM. I think that was I don't know. I wasn't in his mind, but I think that's probably was was his motivation. If we can get a hold of this, then we can turn around and sell it for a lot more. It's a, it was a big quantum engagement on their part. Um, they they got a lot more out of out of it than they put into it. Um, but they didn't write it. They didn't and they didn't innovate it. They didn't create it. And they then they then um, evolved it from there quite a bit. So um, 
there, there, obviously there's a lot of innovation involved in, in, in that process, but um, I, I would say that they, I mean, we haven't really covered root strategy and seed and, all, and so forth, but I think they had a huge root strategy, um, which, was to, which was to acquire the rights to MS-DOS, which turned out to be just the, um, I, I don't know, the, I was gonna say the nugget, I don't wanna mix, mix metaphors here though, it's just, it was a huge life force that was stored in the root of the, of, uh, of the plant, of the, of the weed that they became. Now, does, that, uh, does that make sense? I, you know, that's, I, think that's, I think that was the genius of, of Bill. It was very early on, it was making that deal. I mean, there, there is the storyline, I'm going to just jump quite, quite a bit into Microsoft because they have had a very rich history, right? MS-DOS, IBM, that's one phase, right? Then um, a Mac platform becomes very successful at, at uh, you know, getting the creatives and even schools and everybody else. And then um, uh, Microsoft goes through this phase of building up Windows, right? Yeah. Which is both Mac and Windows copy of Xerox, you know, which Xerox was an internal application, not a public application, you know. Uh, then you move on to uh, these uh, internet comes about, right? Uh, Apple embraces it, you know, then you have things like, and, and Steve Jobs is brought back, right? Uh, iMac, iPhone, iPad, and all sorts of devices to even support this new infrastructure. Bill Gates is infamous for saying that it's a fad, right? Internet is a fad, right? It's going to go away. The other quote from his background was, you don't need more than 640K of memory ever. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what IBM PC gives you. Because uh -huh. everybody else was using Commodore 64 back then, which was only 64K. So 640K, <laughs> more, 10 times more, you don't need anything okay. more than that. <laughs> then then, well, then you what, then I, I actually want to touch the segmentation strategy, right? Because here's a company like Microsoft, very disruptive. When it comes to a platform like Internet, with a new way of doing business, a new way of thinking, a new way of applications, it actually falls behind, right? Uh, Internet Explorer was one of the, uh, the the final entrants into the web browser business. You know when when Netscape was already had the mind share and 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 also all the desktops and stuff like that at that time, right? Then in future, yeah. if you yeah. fast forward it, now they start acquiring companies to like LinkedIn is acquired by Microsoft in order to get into the social media game and so on. But if you fast forward even to 2022 right now, blockchain apps and and, and cryptocurrencies and other types of blockchain type applications that you could be creating using smart contracts and things of that nature. Same to me, it's very much the same because I've lived through that entire, all those cycles, right? Yeah. Does that fall into segmentation strategy? Well, um, well, first of all, I, I would say Microsoft is a really unusual example in that they, someone told, someone explained to me that they're not innovators, they're iterators. And, so they, oh, they they tend to sit back and watch and see see what what takes what creates traction in the in in an industry and then they'll go out and they'll acquire the leader in it. So I mean that's why LinkedIn is part of it's it's part of Microsoft. Um, and uh, so they didn't build it; they just waited until it grew and then said, "Okay, we'll take it take it from here." And pretty then much the job. only business networking platform. Well, I'm saying that. Then they do a great job of making these things massive. Um, yeah. Doesn't work every time. I mean, Hotmail is, is theirs. I don't know if Hotmail is much of a much of a factor these days, but um, no. In that case, Google's did the wait and see. They saw that it was a great platform. The last entrant was Gmail into that mix, and Gmail is now the de facto standard yeah, for yeah. emailing. It's a it's a valid it's a valid approach. Um, you were asking about segmentation, so. So, so the segmentation is one of those eight levels. And, and you know what's really interesting? So the, the reason I call this segmentation strategy is what I'm referring to is when you go out into your garden, into your, into your yard, and you see some weeds and they go, oh, shoot, weeds. And you go and you, I'm going to get them right now. And you grab a hold of them and you reach out and you get it like just a handful of the tops of the stems, but you didn't get the plant, right? Or maybe you maybe even try harder and it breaks off at the root. Um, well, some of some of these weeds are built to do that, and it's it's actually a defense. So they know that that there will be disruption, and they they segment their 
their stems so that the, just a part of the stem comes off. It's, you know, it's a socket. So it just comes out of the socket and the rest of the plant remains. It can it leaves it in a better space to, to recover. And so I, I use that to describe how we should be approaching um, disruptions in, in our, I was going to say in our business, has been in our lives. We've had a lot of them. That's, that's our constant. I mean, there's a, there's a constant flow of, of boom and recession, boom and recession, boom and recession. We just went through then another one, the pandemic. I don't know if we're through it yet, but I hope. I was about fun. to say that. Would you consider uh, the yeah. pandemic to be, uh, to be weed too? Um, well, if the pandemic is just another one of those disruptions. Now, here's the cool thing about disruption. I mean, you know, weeds are, I would say weeds are one of, one of nature's great disruptive forces. But, I, but one of the things that really, I think, really stands out to me about weeds is that they thrive in disrupted ground. I mean, I think disruption is where they probably do the best. So it'll be interesting to apply a weed strategy during a time of, of great disruption. Um, we're, we're heading into a recession. I think it'll be really interesting to see how we can use weed strategy to thrive. And if you're thriving during a recession, then you can create you, you can create great gains in ground, or you know you can buy property at a much less much lower price, et cetera. You can you can make great uh, leaps and bounds during recessionary times. They can be a, a time of great opportunity, but you still have to have a business that's doing well and growing and strong to 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 make that happen. I think weed strategy probably is the is the, is the key to making that happen. Um, but you you were bringing up the pandemic as well, and we saw that there were there were some um, you know, there were some companies that were really well positioned, just maybe almost by accident. Zoom, Peloton, <laughs> yeah. Amazon. You know those. Yeah. They're they're just they were right in the right position at the right time. But then when you watch, let's say something like restaurants. You know they had the model where everybody had to come in and dine in their dining room, and suddenly that was not going to happen. So you could see that some restaurants said, "Okay, great," but. I have, we have the email list of everybody who's been coming in. Let's let's pivot. Let's change our our business model. Let's let's now go from because they still have to eat. And they still like our food, right? They still want us to survive. So let's play with that and and let's let's. I mean, I think the restaurants that did the best were the ones that that um, went to takeout quickly. I mean, they just they just and it, I, it, takeout doesn't even make. That sounds like you know a diner uh, or you know like I don't know, yeah. a drive-through kind of thing. But um, but it was just instead of eating, we have a pizzeria in town and in our little uh, village of Langley, and it's a it's a great pizzeria on a, on, a, on stilts over the water. It's a really cool place, great place to go and have a drink and have a have a pizza. But that changed, so they changed their model and and they're doing a huge business just doing takeout for pizza for right now until they can open their their um their, their, their dining room again so the, the companies that that pivoted uh were exhibiting i would say um uh, a segmentation strategy great a good segmentation strategy some of it is just you know i interviewed one um one entrepreneur a franchisee actually who had two different franchises that complemented each other one was a digital marketing franchise and another one was car wash so in tough times people still want to they still come in to get their car washed but they don't but you know marketing suffers generally during downturns so so that keeps and then when times are good then he for marketing he can then focus on his marketing um, shop but otherwise he's using digital marketing anyway to to build the the, the car wash business so those two really complement each other well it's a great segmentation strategy does that make sense okay, yeah, I mean, one of the historical facts about recession is uh, I think like 70 or 80 percent of Fortune 100 companies were founded during recession. Yeah. So, I mean, think, yeah, think about that, right? It's uh, yeah. so if you think that recession is a bad thing, that, that in that scenario where I mean, a lot of companies sprung up the way being being an internet guy being an e-commerce guy the things that i was anticipating in 2035 got brought into 2020 <laughs> like wow. every grandmother knows now now how to do zoom facetime order from amazon order oh, from yeah. instacart grubhub seamless you name it she knows she doesn't have to leave anything she can and now she can use the time 
to go out and, 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 you know, have fun and also play games online too. So now she knows how to do those things. But before the pandemic, uh, senior citizens, for example, or, or, or people of age uh, above a certain age, right? They were not anticipated to adopt, uh, adapt uh, like technology. But now with a dis huge disruption across all 7 billion of us, we know the importance of a smartphone. <laughs> you know, what kind yeah, of apps yeah. do we need? And in some countries, it, uh, something like a WhatsApp in China is a, uh, is, is a fact of life, right? You, you want to get a taxi like an Uber? It's WhatsApp. It's not Uber, right? So yeah. things like that. The yeah. adoption, I think the disruption has definitely helped uh, in, in that kind of a scenario. I was actually thinking as you were talking, I wanted to bring up the global pandemic, but also the other aspect of global pandemic. How many strains have we seen? That's another example of a weed, right? Uh, how many strains like you go and uh, make, make a vaccine to to go after the first strain that came about, right? But we see that the latest strain, it doesn't do anything with that. Yeah, I think- Nothing. I think viruses, and you have to put on the mask and you have to be very careful, you know? Yeah, I think viruses are a lot like weeds. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> you know, I wanted to mention something though, because in entrepreneur, when we go through recessions and and um, and pandemics, they're, they're huge disruptions to our lives and to our businesses. Um, but if you if you talk to entrepreneurs, a, a disruption is a, is a desired, I mean, that's a, that's a sort of a unicorn quality, actually. It's, it's an incredible thing. They're always looking to disrupt their markets. And, um, and I, so I wanted to recommend another book um, because it's, it inspired me quite a bit. Clayton Christensen's Innovators, The Innovator's Dilemma. And oh. it was a, it's about a, you, you probably know the book. And it's, it's, it's in my audible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a, an incredible book about these market leading businesses that missed the, the, the new uh, upstart disruptive technologies, even though they were like, I think the great example is Kodak. <laughs> Kodak, for those who don't remember, Kodak was, was like the number one producer of film and also developer of cam, I mean, of, of, of pictures. Um, so that was how we took pictures. That's what all our cameras fed, the, this film. And, um, you know, and so obviously it no, became Stu, disruptive Stu, by hold digital on a second. photography. And I want to say, just let me finish this one thought that, Sure. That there was a junior developer, a junior engineer in the bowels of the company that invented uh, digital photography at Kodak, and they, they ignored it. That's in his book, and and they ignored it at, at their peril. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone knows who they are anymore. So yeah, anyway, disruption is an amazing thing, and and weeds they they thrive on disruption. So I think that I'm I'm really excited that there's a recession coming because. I want to use weed strategy. I, I know it'll help. Well, not just me, but a lot of people prosper during that during that uh, uh, the, during during that um, uh, disruption. I, I think it's going to be really actually interesting and exciting. Uh, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to I'm going to ask my usual critical question at the very end, right? Okay. So uh, my thought, because everybody uses the Kodak example, it's a well-known example, right? Uh, what I can tell you is the number one internet company was not Microsoft, it was Google. The, the number one uh, blockchain company was not Google, it was Ethereum, right? And, uh, and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is a lot of these companies and uh, you know, the, the, where you think that the disruption should come from, the disruption in retail did not come from Walmart, it came from Amazon, not a non-existing right. company, right, at, yeah. at its time. Uh, it's right. not Blockbuster, it's Netflix, right? It's not any of the real estate companies, right? Prudential, so on and so forth, right? None of them, it's Airbnb, right? Uh, it, you know, it didn't come from a taxi and limousine commission. It came from Uber, you know, exactly. uh, the disruption yeah. in transport. So yep. that's the thing, like there are so many examples of it, like where you think, because I think the, uh, I, I think complacency plays a definite role in, in that uh, sort of a situation, right? Where, you, where the biggest guy in the room becomes very comfortable so that uh, like in that example, that that lonely engineer that had the answer to digital photography and what what the world should be. Code, he was in the wrong place altogether. You know, you know what, so what, what Christensen argued was that that these market leaders had their own way and they were they were great examples of how to run the businesses the way they were and, and during the times that they that they were that they were dominant. 
But those same systems, those same, um, you know, just the same approach prevented them from doing anything with the next, with the, with the, the next um, disruptive technology that would change their industry. So, you know, they're, they're saying, wait a minute, what are the numbers? And it's, that, it's those kinds of questions. What are the numbers? Has someone else done it? How has it performed? You don't go in look into those things like that. You say, you look at it and you say, oh my God, I see, I see the, the, the value of this. I see that it could be, uh, that it could be incredible and it could change everything of our, our industry. And it may not be what our customers want now, but it will be what they want in the future. And so Christensen says, you know, spin off a, a division to, if you're, if you're Kodak, spin off a division for, to develop digital photography. But as you, as you pointed out, it's so many examples, it's not these market leaders who come up with these new innovations. It's someone else who says, I see, I mean, it's Elon Musk coming up with a way to, to, put, to put satellites and, and payloads into space totally differently than everyone else had. had Private space travel industry. Yeah. I mean, just think yeah, about that. It didn't yeah. exist. It was just government agencies that were doing that before. But know? the thing that's really cool is that weeds love that. That's just where they thrive. They, they thrive in disrupted ground. So, so Stu, um, let me let me ask you this. I mean, I ask every one of my guests, what, and be, because this that's the tagline for this show, what is your number one hundred thousand dollar expert insights into uh, weed mindset, weed strategy weed. <laughs> for companies to thrive and grow uh, like weed? Well, um, well, for, you're gonna hate my answer because one of them is uh, is read the whole book. <laughs> first um, and 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 the reason I'm saying that besides the fact that yes I would love to have everyone go out and buy the book but the reason I'm saying that really is that um, as I said at the outset there are four elements to the weed strategy um, uh, model um, it weed strategy is the theory of everything about growing anything if you only <clears throat> if you only take part of it uh, like let's say if you only take one of the one of the four multipliers, then you're only getting a quarter of the multiplication you could be getting from weed strategy. Having said all that, my favorite are developing unfair advantages. I think those those are so well, they're just they're they're interesting and they're exciting. And and when I talk about my unfair advantages, I mean I'm like I, I'm thrilled to tell you about. Hey, I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists, and my cartoons reach millions of people when they go out. Um, or I've got a new partnership with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and we're doing the Total Weed Award together. And that's an incredible partnership for me and a totally unfair advantage. So it lights like, it lights my brain up. So create unfair advantages probably is, I would say creating unfair advantage, but I'm also gonna say that you should pair that with um, with with going to, to multi, getting away from one-to-one -one leverage because if you're stuck in that, doesn't matter how many unfair advantages you have, you won't scale. Does that okay. make sense? I mean, it's still actually what I'm really saying is do the whole thing. <laughs> totally. So I'm going to yeah. flash this one more time. Uh, this, so this is the book. Uh, that definitely you guys should look it up on, on Amazon, How to Grow Your Business Like a Weed. It's available in, in, uh, in Audible, print, uh, as well as in, on Kindle. Uh, please go in and, and definitely get it, add it to your library. And, and, def and definitely uh, look through it and definitely follow uh, Stu. Uh, you can access him, uh, Stu at Heineck.com and uh, on social uh, at Stu Heineck on most of the platforms, I believe. Uh, actually, actually, I got to correct you there. It's Stu at Stu Heineck. Stu at Stu Heineck. Okay, dot um, com. Well, that's his email address. And, and, or, and you can go, also, you can go to my author site, Stu Heineck.com, and you can get download a couple of free chapters yeah. of the, oh, of wow. the week book. And I want to show you one thing real quick. Sure. You can buy T-shirts like this. <laughs> Chief Weed. <laughs> Chief Weed. You, you need to you need to update your LinkedIn to make, to make sure that it says that. <laughs> uh, well, th thank you, Stu. It, it, it was fabulous. I mean, I, I had enjoyed uh, our uh, first interview, and and this was uh, a grand slam again. Thank you very much for being on the show and sharing your new book uh, with us. And uh, you have an open invitation. You write another book. We would love to have you on the show again. Thank you. And what a, what a pleasure to be with you again, Sabir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for tuning in live, for the folks who tuned in live. Uh, and we had quite a few people. And uh, we uh, and also, if you're ch checking this out on a recording on, on any of the platforms, this show is available on YouTube primarily. 
But if you catch it on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, uh, there is a recording of the show available. Uh, thank you again, and have a good day. Thank you very much, Stu, for being on the show.